Grab your Bibles if you got a Matthew chapter 21. This is Palm Sunday. And um, I want to I share a message with you that is entitled, Hope Road In. You, you know, this is, the, this is the, the, the time that we celebrate the, Jesus having the triumphal entry, riding into Jerusalem. And, and so this morning, I, I want to talk about that a little bit. And I want to bring some truths out of it. And it will kind of parallel with kind of where we are. Although, how many know... God is no different during COVID than he is before there was COVID, right? And so, and we can preach a message that kind of has to deal with it, but it's the same all the time. And, and so you know this story. The story is uh, Jesus coming into Jerusalem. Let me read a little bit of, out of uh, Matthew 21. When they approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus said to his disciples, go into the village opposite you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied there, and a colt with her, untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the full of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them and brought the donkey and the colt and laid their coats on them, and he sat on their coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. The crowds going ahead of him, and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. I love this passage of Scripture. You see the celebration. You see the pageantry, and you see everything that goes with it. They're shouting. They're praising. They're throwing carts, coats down. They are putting, waving palm branches. So what, what happens? All of a sudden, what, what, is, what, is this, what is it that's going on? Why is all this happening? Why is it happening that, that there's this self, there's this praise, there's this, all this demonstration? You see, because something happened. You have a people, the Israelites, who are occupied by a, an oppressor. The Romans have oppressed them, and the Romans have occupied them. They're not their own kingdom. They're not their own people. They can't rule and govern themselves. And yet, here comes this person riding on a donkey. I don't know about you, but donkeys aren't very majestic. I've never really said to myself, you know, I'd really like to ride a donkey. I've rode a camel. That was pretty cool. I've rode horses. But I can't tell you that I've ever had this desire to say, I think I, I want to ride that donkey. All right, so, so, but what happens? So, so all of a sudden, here's what happens. They're shouting, they're praising, they're all this, because why? First of all, their hope was in a person. Hope rode in, in a person. All right, I want you to, I want you to see this this morning. He rode in, in a person. They were afflicted, they were occupied. Their state of affliction had caused them to cry out. Their state of affliction had caused them to cry out to Jesus. And this is what they're saying, Hosanna which means save now, Hosanna, save now. They cried out for mercy, they cried out. I mean, we don't cry out for mercy unless we're afflicted. Affliction and need has a way of causing hope to rise in our heart and have a way of causing us to um, cry out in hope. It, rarely do we cry out for help unless we are in need. Rarely will we cry out of hope unless we're in need of hope. We raise the cries of hope unless we're in a situation. Hope is birthed, first of all, in the character of the king. I want you to see what the scripture says. All right? Zechariah chapter 9 was a prophecy, and that prophecy was that what you're seeing there, Hosanna to the son. Prior to that, first of all, before that, in verse 5, it says, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey. You have to understand something this morning. Hope was birthed in their heart because now one was coming who had a character that was different than any other ruler they had. He did not come in power and might to lord over them. He did not come in the power of a horse. He did not come in a, 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 in a character that he'd have to lord over them and wield power in order to have authority in their life. He came gentle, riding on a donkey to show the humility by which he would serve, the humility by which he would lead people, the humility which would cause him to become their suffering savior, to go to the cross and die on a cross for them. It was his humility. You see, the beauty of the kingdom of God is that it does not lord over people. It actually, it actually comes under in order to serve so that to elevate his people. His, it was, help was birthed through the character of the king. He was, they, they were, they were, um, they, they, they could see the demonstration of his character as he rode in on that donkey. 
I don't know about you. If I'm coming in to set myself up as king and to announce myself as a king, I'm coming in on a horse. I want a big horse. I want a white horse or maybe a jet black one. I want one that's just a bad horse. It shows my power. It shows my might. Not Jesus. He came in riding a donkey. And that hope in their king caused them to appeal for the mercy of their king. Right? They begin to cry out. They begin to shout, Hosanna, save us. Hosanna, save us now. I want you to think throughout the scriptures. In Matthew chapter 9, we have two blind men. Two blind men. They hear of Jesus coming. And this is what they said. They cried out, have mercy on us, son of David. Have mercy on us, son of David. Something happened in these blind men who were afflicted with blindness, who were oppressed with this disease that caused them to be blind. And something happened when they heard that Jesus was near. Hope rose in their heart that caused them to cry out for mercy. How about the Canaanite woman that had the little girl who was demon-possessed? And she came to Jesus and she said, have mercy, have mercy on me, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. She was an appeal for mercy. And then again, later in Matthew 20, another two blind men cry out, have mercy on us, son of David. Affliction appeals for mercy. The cry goes out before they, the cry of hope goes out even before you are relieved of your affliction. I want to say to you this morning, some of you have been afflicted with this disease. Some of you have been afflicted not necessarily with the disease itself, but everything that has come with it. Loneliness, isolation. Some of you have financial hardships. Some of you have a number of things that this thing has caused affliction. It's in your heart. It's in your mind. I want to say to you this morning, allow hope to rise in your heart and give a cry of mercy to your king. And I promise you, he'll meet you there. You see, hope rode in on a, on a donkey. I rode in in a person. But let me say to you something this morning. Hope also rode in, in the prophetic. You gotta, you gotta understand what's happening here. Why would these people be so excited, singing, shouting, waving palms, putting their coats on? Because what they were seeing in their eyes, with their eyes, was the prophetic word of God coming to pass in their life. Let me tell you something. One thing I love to see is when the prophetic word of God comes to pass in my life. And I'm not talking just about if somebody gives me a prophetic word. Listen to me this morning. I've said this all the time. I believe in a prophetic office. I believe in prophets. But I also believe in the word of God that is prophetic in your life and in my life. That I can read it and it's prophetic to me. It's the spirit of Jesus speaking to me and prophesying to me that I can believe his word's going to come to pass. That when he says, I'm going to meet all your needs according to my riches and glory, I can bank on that because that's his prophetic word. And it causes hope to rise in my heart. You see, I want you to hear this. They were crying out, Hosanna. And they were saying, you're the, king, the son of David. The son of David. Hosanna to the son of David. What, what were they saying? What they were saying, you have to understand something. The son of David was a term they were using based upon the prophetic promises of God. It was a term that revealed their hope in who he was. It was the son of David was the one they were longing for. The son of David is the one they were looking for. It was based upon the prophetic promises of God. Let me read you a couple of scriptures. Matthew chapter 1 is the genealogy. Now, you know they're extremely exciting. Actually, they're kind of cool when you really dig through them. But first of all, Matthew 1.1 1, 1 says, The record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Hmm. And then in Matthew 1 verse 20 when angel was speaking to Joseph, he said, the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David. Hmm. Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife for the child's been conceived of her. See, understand something. This term that came to Jesus that was being said by the people is in response to the prophetic word of God. You see, you got to go back. And if you go back into the book of Samuel, whenever Nathan the prophet is speaking to David, and he promised him three things. God promised him three things. He promised him an enduring kingdom, an enduring house, and that one of his, his son would be on the throne forever. You see, and, and what that was is that's a messianic prophecy that ultimately is speaking towards Christ one day. And the people of Israel, the people of uh, uh, the Jewish people knew that the Messiah was going to be the son of David. And now in their midst, here was 
the prophetic of God coming to pass. They see him coming on a donkey fulfilling Zechariah chapter 9. And now they're lifting up a shout in conjunction with the prophetic word of, sec- of, of 1 Samuel, I believe it is, chapter 7. Hmm. You see, the prophetic promises of God always produce hope in God. When God, listen, if, you know, how many know God can even speak a convicting word to you? God can speak a disciplining word to you and still cause hope in you because he's not looking to crush you. He's looking to restore you and build you up. You see, the, the amazing thing about God is anytime God speaks in a prophetic nature through his word, there's hope that rises in my heart because God is never going to speak to me out of his word for my, for my demise. He's never going to do that and not raise harp, hope in my heart. Because my hope is based in who he is. My hope is based in his character. My hope is based in his word. And here they were. They are seeing this come to life in front of them. There's the fulfillment of Zechariah. We've seen his miracles. We've seen his power. Here he comes. Now he's riding on this donkey, gentle, humble. This is the fulfillment of Zechariah 9. This is our king coming to us. And they're excited. And hope rises rises in their heart. And then they begin to cry out the prophetic word of God. This is the son of David. This is the one who's going to bring the house of Israel back. This is the one who's going to get rid of the Roman oppressors. We'll talk about that in a moment. This is the one whose throne will endure forever. And this, the prophetic promises of God always, always produce the hope of God. So hope rode in, in a person. And hope rode in. In the prophetic, but hope also rode in, in praise. Okay? Think about this. It rode in, in praise. They begin to shout, blessed, this is what they're on. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Matthew says it one way. Mark says it one way. Luke says it one way. That word blessed means to celebrate with praise. So celebrate, you know what we did this morning? Even through live stream, we celebrated with praise. We celebrated, we worship, we praise. We're celebrating our God. We're celebrating our King. This is what they were doing. They were celebrating. They were celebrating an anticipated King. Here comes our King. They were celebrating with praise an anticipated kingdom. They were celebrating an anticipated throne. This anticipation was based upon the prophetic it was based upon the promises of God. And they're just hooping it up, man. They're just, they're like, they're, like, they're like me when I get off the hook, you know. Like they were just waving those branches and they were throwing the coats down and, and they're shouting and they're singing and they're dancing and they're just having a high old time. But then Luke says some of the Pharisees said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Shut them up. Get them quiet. How many know a religious spirit hates a worshiping spirit? A religious spirit can't stand a spirit that's free to worship and praise them. And you know what Jesus says? (laughs) If they become silent, those stones, those stones will praise me. Those stones will cry out. They'll break forth because all creation praises me. You see, you got to understand something. Hope and praise go hand in hand. Uh, Psalm 42, I think I read it last week to you. Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. Hope and praise go hand in hand. Hope and praise are like a hand in a glove. You see, a heart without hope is a mouth without praise. A heart without hope Is a mouth without praise. How is it that I can praise my God through a pandemic? Because my hope's in my God. How is it that I can praise my God in the midst of losing a son? Because my hope is in my God. Right? How is it that, Tim Lezinski, you can go through what you've gone through physically and you still praise him and you still worship him because your hope is in him? 
And I could go on and on. I could talk to some of you on live stream. Some of you got businesses this morning. And some of you are wondering, how is this business going to make it through? How am I going to get through? You're going to get through. Put your trust in God. Allow your heart to be filled with hope and who he is. Allow hope to fill your mouth with praise. And begin to cry out. And begin to cry out. And do not let the enemy silence your voice. You silence his voice with a mouth of praise. A soul without hope is a mouth without a shout of praise. A soul without hope is a mouth without a shout of praise. Psalm 71, but as for me, I will hope continually. I will hope continually. And I will praise you yet more and more. Isn't that? I will hope, I will, I will, I will praise you. I will hope continually. I will hope continually over and over and over. And I'm going to praise you more and more. You see that? Hope is continual, which makes praise continual. Hope is perpetual. Praise is perpetual. A song without hope is a a mouth without a song of praise. Hope in God creates praise of God. Hope in God births praise for God. Hope in God births a shout of praise to our God. Could it be this morning, some of you have no praise because you have no hope? Could it be that that some have no worship because you have no hope? Could it be that you have no shout because you have no hope? Hope comes from who he is. It's amazing. So what happens is, and let me tell you, so, so here they are. Jesus is riding in on a donkey. Hope rode in in a person. Hope rode in in the prophetic. And hope rode in, in praise. But watch this. But hope rode out on the plan of man. But hope ran out, rode out on the plan of man. Let me read you, let me read you what Luke said. Luke said, as Jesus approached Jerusalem. Now listen, they've already been singing. They've already been shouting. They've already been praising him. And now they, he gets close to the city. And as he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it. What's he weeping for? And he said, if you'd, only, if you'd had known in this day, even you, the things which would make for peace. But now they've been hidden from your eyes. For the time will come upon you when your enemies will throw a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And I could go on. But all of a sudden, Jesus looks at the city, weeps over it. Because he sees where the city is going to be without hope. It's going to be without hope. It's going to be without peace. And the reason it's going to be without hope and without peace is because there would actually be a rejection of him and who he was and what he came to do as the Messiah. And when that rejection came in, the reason it came in was this. He said, because you did not recognize the day of your visitation, that this was the hour your Messiah was in your midst. They missed the moment. You see, because what they thought they knew would cause them to miss what they didn't know. Oftentimes in our life, what you think you know will cause you to miss what you need to know. You ever try to, you ever, you ever try to talk to somebody who's a know-it-all? Like, they, like, like, it would be like me trying to tell Pastor Troy how the computer actually works on the inside. Now, I can tell him when it's not working right, but I sure can't tell him how to fix it. And it'd be like me saying, well, Troy, this is what you got to do. No, I usually just threaten him and say, if you don't get this thing fixed by the next time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it outside, and I'm going to run it over with my car, and then I'm going to back up and run it over again. <laughs> I have literally said that to him. <laughs> but the point is, they missed what they thought they knew because of what they thought they knew. What you don't know will cause you to miss what's in your midst. What you think you know about God may miss, cause you to miss what you need to know about God. It is amazing to me how ex- inexhaustive God is and his word is. I've been preaching his word for 20 years in this church, and it still blows me away the things I learn about his word and him. You see, when they saw the man on the donkey, hope rose in their heart. There's the Messiah, Zechariah 9. When they saw the man who was to be their king, hope rose in their hearts. When they saw the man who would be the son of David, 
hope rose when they saw the man who was to be the successor to David's throne, to the one who would establish David's house and the, David's kingdom. Hope rose in their hearts and came out of their mouth when they saw this man. But what happened, what happened that would end their hope? What was it that would happen? What happened is it wouldn't be long where many of this same crowd would be saying, crucify him, calling for his demise. A moment ago, they were saying, what would happen? Well, I think I'm going to say it like this. They had hope in the right man, but not in his plan. They had hope in the right man. He was the Messiah. He was the king. He was the son of David. He was all the things they said. They were right. He was the right man. And their hope was in the right man, but not in his plan. Hmm. I have that actually twice on the screen. Must, God must want me to emphasize it. <laughs> Whenever you make a mistake and you're just a, a knucklehead like me, you blame it on God and say, God wants you to know it twice. <laughs> so, all right, so there it is again. Uh, they had hope in the right man, but not in his plan. Think about this for a moment. Where is hope found? Where is my hope in him found? Hope is founded in the man Jesus and the plan of Jesus. In the man Jesus and the plan of Jesus. You see, Jesus was coming in. He was the man. He was the son of David. He was the Messiah. He was the king. And he had a plan. But the problem was his plan and their plan didn't match up. And when his plan didn't meet their plan, they rejected him as the man. Oh, man, I got to tell you how many times in my life where I have said, you're the man, but I don't like your plan. I, come on. I don't know where you're at this morning, but you can, I, I want to say to you, there's going to be times where you're going to recognize he's the man, but you don't like his plan. Trust the plan. Trust the plan. I, I got to tell you something this morning. And right now, we're going through a saga. We're going through an era. And this, I'm going to tell you to you, and some of you won't like it. I love you. You love me. This was not his plan. God doesn't, it, it, it's not his judgment. Okay, I'm just telling you right now, the pandemic that's hit our world is not God's judgment about sin. He judged sin, and he paid for sin at Calvary's cross through his son, and if pandemics were judgment of sin, then we should live in a, pan, a perpetual pandemic 24-7. God did not say, I'm going to give you my son, and I'm going to pour out my wrath on him on the cross so that later on I can punish you with a, with a plague. We must view everything that happens through the cross. Now listen to me. But one thing you need to understand is he is the one who can take everything the devil means for evil and turn to good and use for divine purposes. He will use this to bring you to a place of repentance. He's going to use some of us to humble our hearts. He's going to use this to bring some of us, okay, let, let me clean my hands, just as George Bell was talking two weeks ago, that we've been washing our hands constantly with this COVID-19. When God, the Bible's looking, I mean, the Bible, God is looking for those with a clean hand and clean hearts. And it's going to cause us to repent. It's going to cause humility. But I want to tell you something. It was not a pandemic that found its origin in God. But my God will use it. And he's got a plan. And that plan's going to help you walk through this. And I promise you, if you humble yourself and you'll seek his face, he's going to say to you, here's how you're going to make it through this. Here's my plan. I am the man and I have a plan. And my plan for you is not to bring you to demise. It is not for your demise. It is not for you to waste away business owner. It's not. Trust the man. Trust his plan. You must hope in the right man and his plan. You must hope in the man and his plan. You know, I, 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 when I think about that, sometimes we have this notion, and I, and I heard, you know, we, we look and we think everything that happens in the world is part of God's plan, like it's a blueprint. That's just not true. There are things that happen all the time that aren't God's plan. I do things that aren't part of God's will all the, all the time. When I sin, it's not God's will. And if it's not God's will, it's not his plan. Everything that happens is not part of his plan. But he'll always have a plan for even that which wasn't his plan. He's a divine chess player. You see, you got to hope in the man and his plan. It's like when you hire an architect to draw up your house. You're trusting him and you're trusting his plan. And you build it according to the plan. If you don't trust him, you're not going to trust his plan. They had hope in the right man but they were putting a plan in place. They, they had their own 
plan. You see, what we do sometimes, let's be honest, is we put our hope in him as the man so that he can execute our plan. I trust you, Jesus, and here's my plan. I trust you, Jesus, let me give you the one, two, three-step plan how you need to do this. I trust you as the man, but I got the plan, so I need you to execute my plan. Hmm. I don't think that's exactly how it's supposed to go. They wanted this man to execute their plan. Come in, set up your throne, kick Rome out, get him out. Now listen, I would have wanted the same thing. I'd have wanted the same thing. They wanted this man to fulfill the plan they had for him. Even his disciples at times wanted him to fulfill the plan they had for him. Remember, remember Peter, no, no, Lord, you're not going to Jerusalem. No, you're not going to Jerusalem. Get behind me, Satan. Trust the man, trust his plan. You see, they saw Jesus coming into the city on that donkey. And when they saw that, hope arose in their heart. This is the one the prophets have been prophesying about. This is the one that Zechariah prophesied about. This is the one who's the son of David. This is the future king. This is our future kingdom who's going to bring it in. This is the one promised to carry on the house of David. This is the one to kick out the oppressors. This is the one who will now give the kingdom to Israel. Even in Acts chapter 1, when Jesus taught them for 40 days about the kingdom of God, the disciples looked at him and said, Lord, is this the hour? Is this the moment that you're going to restore the kingdom back to Israel? They still hadn't got what Jesus was doing. He says, not for you to know the times and the epochs set by my father. What they wanted was power. What they wanted was to give us, this is the moment we get our political power to get rid of our oppressors. They wanted power. Jesus said, I know you what you want. You want power. He said, and you will, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You want power, and I'm going to give you power, but it's not the power you think you need, and it's not the power you want. It's the power you're going to need to fulfill the mandate upon you. And it's going to come through the Holy Spirit. I say to you this morning, you have power in this hour because of the Holy Spirit of God who dwells within you, believer. You have power. And I believe in this moment that God wants to use you, just to use them to be his witnesses to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, to the othermost ends of the earth. This can be an hour. This can be an hour where people see the Spirit of God that lives inside of you. They, they were <clears throat> celebrating this one who was going to give them the kingdom. Bless his name. Hosanna, save now. They were celebrating for what they anticipated him doing. They were celebrating based upon an expectation of what he was going to do. And when they didn't go that way, and the way they thought it should, they rejected him. But let me say something to you. You're watching this live stream today, and you're a believer, and you're a believer in Jesus Christ. You're a, you're a son of God. You are a citizen of the kingdom of God. Here's, here's the good news. We don't celebrate Jesus just for what we anticipate him doing. We celebrate him for what he already did. You see, listen, they were celebrating him for what they anticipated he was going to do. He was going to come in. He was going to be king. He was going to get rid of Rome. And when that didn't happen, they rejected him. You see, for us this morning, we don't celebrate Jesus just for what we anticipate him doing, but what he already did. He already came. He already conquered sin. He conquered death. He conquered the grave. He conquered sickness. He conquered disease. Listen to me this morning. He came. He's already our king. He's seated on the throne. He's at the right hand of the Father. We celebrate a king who is now. We know he's coming someday. Again, we don't celebrate an anticipated king. We celebrate an actual king. Pilate said, are you a king? He said, it is. I am. And it was for this purpose I was born. Hmm. Come on. You have a king this morning. It's just not an anticipated king. You see, because, listen to me this morning, the kingdom is now and not yet. There's a fulfillment to come, but there's a reality now. And the reality now is you live in it now, and you have a king now. And everything you do right now is you live under the domain of the king. You live under the culture and the values and the principles 
of the king and his kingdom now. You're a citizen. Paul said our citizenship is in heaven. We are citizens of the kingdom of God now. And we have a king now. It makes a big difference in how you celebrate him. We don't celebrate an anticipated kingdom. We celebrate an actual kingdom. They were celebrating what they hoped was going to come. We're celebrating what already has come. Because Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. He told his disciples, go preach this message. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. He taught them for 40 days. When Philip went into Samaria, he preached the good news of the kingdom of God. Man, i got to tell you something this morning. we got to understand that, that we're not just celebrating an anticipated kingdom. We're celebrating the one we live in now. The one that lives in me, Jesus said. You see, we have hope in his anticipated second coming. That's how we know he's coming back one day. The Bible promises it. But we have hope now in his actual first coming. We have hope now because he actually came. And because of what he actually did. And because of what he did at Calvary. Our hope this morning is just not in anticipation, but it's in actuality of what we believe he did as we believe in faith and through faith. Let me give, let me give hope to the online live stream world. I want to give those three favorite words of the church. Come on, Troy. <laughs> Come on, Troy. All of, all of live stream just all of live stream just went. Praise God. There's hope. <laughs> Our hope is in. Come on, Troy. I even have fun on the stream. But I want to say something in closing. Listen to me this morning. Listen to me. Hope wrote in. It wrote in in the person of Jesus Christ. Listen to me this morning, hope is still found in Jesus Christ. Pandemic or no pandemic, no matter what life throws at you, no matter what you're walking through, there's hope today because of who he is, because of his character. Hope wrote in in the prophetic, listen to me this morning, God's promises are still true. God's word is still true. This morning, if you need hope to rise in your heart, get into the Word of God and see the promises and see the prophetic God. God will speak to you prophetically. You don't need to go. Again, when I say this, please understand me. I believe in the prophetic. I believe in prophets. But I want to say to you this morning that you can prophesy to yourself through the Word of God. Pick up the Word of God and read it and allow the Spirit of God to prophesy to you in the Word of God. And I promise you that hope will rise in your heart because He has a hope for you. It's a hope of good. It's a future of good. He has a plan for you, and it's not for your demise. It wrote in in a person, it wrote in a prophetic. And allow it to come into your heart with praise, that you celebrate him, that the hope you have in him, the hope in your heart, produces a praise out of your mouth. And now, but don't let it run out when your plan and his plan don't match up. Trust the man, trust his plan.